Lotus Pixel, and welcome to my last art talk of 2023. Good coffee. Good coffee. Um, I want to share a bit of a retrospective with you today. Not just a ret retrospective of the last year of 2023. I think that's way too short-sighted. No, I'd rather share with you a retrospective of the last 20, 30 years that I've been in this in this career of animation and illustration and concept art and video games and film and then teaching which has been my greatest joy for the last geez well I started lucid pixel my online mentorship back in 2015 but I've been teaching for many years before that animation art illustration concept art and all that kind of stuff and the reason I want to kind of put that on the table. I want to mention this and highlight that fact about my career is the fact that the retrospective that I'm going to share, my thoughts and feelings about where we have been as artists and where we're going moving forward is, spoiler alert, a very, very positive one. In spite of all of these controversies and stressful things we've had to deal with this year or over the last few years and these hiccups in society like COVID and being locked down and then how that kind of rattled the whole work structure and and the and the way I feel that the the industry in general the work industry in general is it's at a turning point right now positive or negative not quite sure but I can say after working with teaching mentoring and learning from thousands of artists thousands of students from every walk of life from every country on the planet I've had the pleasure of meeting with and, and befriending and being inspired by by artists from every single corner of the planet I can say with absolute confidence that we are all completely identical <laughs> minus perhaps our accent apart from that we're all in this together and that brings me and hopefully it brings you a lot of comfort and joy and a feeling of community, a feeling of family. As an artist, you're not just uh, you're not just somebody who sits alone in the room and draws cool shit, or comes up with ideas, or f feels like crap about yourself because you can't draw that day and you're full of self doubt. No, you're a part of the family. You're a part of this world, this this more and more intimate world of artists. We are much more connected to this world of artists around us. And you should you should wear that title like a badge of honor. And there's Gimli. My cat's meowing. He wants attention. It's playtime around now. But I'm talking to you, so he's going to have to wait a bit. <laughs> um, so yeah, I want to look back at the last 20, 30 years um, in brief, of course, I'm not going to explain every every everything the, the entire process. But I want to share with you where things uh, where I saw things have been in the past, and where I see things have come today. And in spite of all of these little obstacles that we've had to deal with, all of these little hiccups, what we don't necessarily get insight into, what I want to share with you, is the day to day life of an artist and how all of these different realities that we have to navigate today and in the past, how they truly do impact us on a day-to-day -day basis. It's very easy to get caught up in all of that, all of that controversial talk and all of that worrisome news about innovation and, and automation and all that kind of stuff and think that life is doomed. But when you actually get to deal with artists on a day-to-day -day basis, you realize that that makes up 1% of the impact on the industry. And in fact, where we might feel be feeling a little bit of stress in one place, everything else is flourishing and growing and moving forward as it should. If I go back to the beginning of my career when I first started really actively learning art, my access to resources for learning art were much more limited than they are today. Now, one of the things that I'm very excited about, that I love about modern day society, is our access to information, our access to tools to learn. And we can learn pretty much anything we want at any point. 
we can we can pick up any tool we can pick up any skill and we can run with it and get ourselves to a very functional if not a professional level completely on our own i was just the other day i was watching um actually it was just yesterday i spent hours drawing this drawing that you're watching me draw right now listening to a lot of uh, anthony jones's live podcasts and stuff like that and he was talking about um he was just talking about how he was learning programming. He was picking up programming because he was very big into game design and stuff like that. And he said he was talking about how a lot of a lot of artists can get very discouraged by this or that, or they, they're very overwhelmed by this or that. And he goes, no, man, you just need to sit down and learn it. That's all you got to do. You just got to sit down and learn. And now an artist, you know, a, a successful concept artist and illustrator is learning programming and learning how to build his own games and Put together his own game engines and he realizes it's not nearly as complicated as you want you just have to just get to get your hands dirty and get into it but you have access to resources out there you can learn anything you want youtube is an absolute gold mine for learning stuff if you want something you can go for it and i've seen how that access to information has really manifested into um incredibly talented artists um, a really good example is, well, not only the artist that I teach on a regular basis, but my daughter, who's graduated from illustration and now she's starting to get her, she's starting to get herself into um, uh, working professionally. She's just, just starting off. This is, this, like her, she's taking her first steps into it. And she even just started her own, uh, her own Etsy shop, which was pretty freaking cool, which I linked. You can go and check it out. I'll leave a link to her Etsy shop in the, in the link below if you want to go to check it out. And I'm sitting there looking at what she's drawing in her early 20s. And by all accounts, what she draws, how she draws, the quality of her line work and her design and the color and the, and the, the, the creativity and the influences that she's got, everything. Um, just objectively, just looking at her as an artist, not my daughter, none of that, just looking at her as a, as a raw artist is is leaps and bounds better than I could have ever wished to be or any of my peers in school could have wished to be at her age. It's, it's, there's no comparison. If she, uh, somebody at her skill level and the skill level of so many of the artists that I work with that are around the same age as my daughter who are producing art I'm sitting there looking at what they're going, looking at what they're doing and thinking to myself, you're absolutely spectacular. I mean, that is top tier professional artwork. I mean, go and look at it for you. You can go and see it for yourself if you go and check out her shop. It's, it's pretty incredible stuff. I'm gobsmacked at how amazing artists are today. And I've, I've heard this from many people. I've heard it from Anthony Jones. I've heard it from Tyler Edlin. I've heard it from all of these industry veterans, veterans the Chris Oatleys and, and the Hardy Fowlers and all of these artists. I, I hear them say all the time. They express this about the artists that they teach and work with. I'm absolutely mind blown at, at how good artists are today. And I remember another, spe uh, referencing Anthony Jones again, I remember him talking about uh, one of one of my favorite Gumroads by his, at least in terms of uh, just the concept, his his ideas and what he talks about in his Gumroads very often are so amazingly important, and he knows how to really get inside the artist's mind and kind of say, yeah, this is this is this is that obstacle you're dealing with, and this is why you're dealing with it. They're really, it's very cool. I learn a lot from from following him, and um, one of them is called, I think it's called uh, Cool Factor. I think he calls it the cool factor. And in it, he talks about how if you compare modern and older artists, if you look at, for instance, like a transformer or a mech or something like armored core type of a design that was done back in the 1980s and 90s, and even just before the turn of the, the millennium. And you look at what they drew back then and you compare it to what people are drawing today. There's no comparison. I mean, from a skill level, technically speaking, holy shit. It's incredible. <laughs> the skill level of artists nowadays and how we've grown and gotten better over the years is just incredible. And I find it very exciting as a teacher and as a mentor that I, I feel that as I move forward and work with more and more artists and I grow and develop as an artist myself, that 
I'm not just teaching as much anymore. I, 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 if I look back at my, if my teaching career over the last 10, 15 years, and I think about, um, I think about what it was like to teach. It was a lot, there was a lot more of me just kind of showing people the ropes and showing people how to do stuff and, and, and giving them the tools to get better. But as the years have progressed, I've, I've been doing this long enough to see the progression of artists and I'm realizing that I'm becoming a student a lot more. That I sit down with artists very often that are, that are at a very similar, similar skill level to myself. Despite, despite the fact that they might be 10 years younger than me, because I'm approaching 50 at this point. You know, they might be 10, 15, 20 years younger than me, but I'm sitting there going, no, I can learn some shit from you. You've got some skills that I can really learn from. So that whole teaching experience between me and, and, and my student, I'm, I'm starting to become more and more of a student as well. And I'll stop and ask them questions sometimes and we'll kind of feed off of each other. So that whole teaching experience becomes a little bit of a collaboration. It's not just Adam the hotshot who's telling them what to do and telling them how to be better. I'm sitting at their work and I'm saying, no, maybe you could show me something there because you're doing something that I, that, that I really want to learn and you're doing it a lot better than I can do. Can you show me? And sometimes it kind of takes them back a little bit that I have a student who says, Adam wants to learn something from me. Oh my God, this is weird. <laughs> but then when they realize, no, I actually do know what I'm talking about and I do have something valuable to share, then, um, then they start to get that confidence. They start to build a little bit more confidence and realize, no, Adam, just, Adam might be older and Adam might be running a business, but, but he's in this to learn too. And then they re th their value starts to shine as well. And I see this more and more every day. I am incredibly impressed and excited about where art's going. Not based of what I'm doing. I'm just an artist doing my thing, just like you. But when you get a bit, little bit more of a global overview on, on, on the growth of our community artistically and where we're going artistically, it fills you with confidence. It fills you with a lot of excitement that we're just getting started. We're a very, very young little world, a very young industry. And whatever innovation and whatever evolution our society goes through, I know that artists nowadays, young and old, are clever enough and talented enough to be able to harness that to create some very cool things. And to be able to, to observe and assimilate these new technologies without a bias, without a fear, but with a sense of creativity and a sense of a sense of cleverness and and uh, creativity, so that they can use it as a tool to evolve and move forward and get better and better at what we do. And as you work with these artists and you start to see how artists are, are implementing technology and implementing skills of old and skills of new and coming up with new creative ideas, you, re you start to see opportunities unlock. You start to see hope and excitement for the future and not this fear that there's some technology, some artificial intelligence that's going to destroy us all and consume us and, and drain us of our life force like the matrix and, and turn us into art batteries. That isn't happening anytime soon. Artists are, are indestructible in that sense in the, because artists are incredibly adaptable. The creative spirit is an adaptable spirit. If I hand you an idea and then throw a curveball at you, like improv, you're very capable of taking that and writing with it and completely transforming your creative process. And as artists, if, especially if you're a younger artist and you're worried about the future of where we're going artistically, of where this industry is going artistically, take it from somebody who's got a lot of insight into this, somebody who works with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of artists and somebody who's got a really good sense of where things have been and where they're going, you've got nothing to worry about. I want to encourage you not to be afraid. I want you to instead be creative. I want you to instead be innovative. I want you to instead to have a positive outlook moving forward on where things are going. In that sense, we've got nothing, really legitimately nothing to worry about. And I know that there are going to be people in the comments or there might even be other, you know, other um, very well-spoken and very well-educated and very celebrated artists out there who have a platform of their own who might 
say things to the contrary or might argue to the contrary of this and say, you know, no, things are not good and things are doomed. And if we don't take action, then we are going to, things are going to be over for us and we're, things are going to fall apart. And as much as I love them and as much as they're my brothers and sisters and as much as I support them in everything that they do, I'm going to stand my ground with my opinion because I just live in a reality where I see way too much evidence to the contrary, where it matters. I'm not following news. I'm not following salacious or, or inflammatory headlines. I'm not following clickbaity titles that, that get people all riled up. I'm paying attention to the artists in their intimate spaces day by day, seeing this time and time again, and I've seen thousands and thousands of examples of this. Have I seen artists become more and more disillusioned? Have I seen artists become more alienated from their artwork? Have I seen artists losing their jobs and losing their value and being replaced with machines? No. In fact, I'm seeing the opposite. I'm seeing artists double down. I'm seeing artists get double creative. I'm seeing artists get more talented. I'm seeing artists see this as a challenge, facing the challenge, and just getting better and, and proving time and time again that the worth and the value of the individual, of the human, of the artist themselves and their unique contribution to this big world of artistic growth just keeps on getting, getting bigger and better. And I'm not worried, even remotely. 2023 was a year that rattled a lot of cages and I could see in the comments of people that were getting very caught up in videos or different art talks or vlogs or podcasts by people who were very worried for understandable reasons. They were worried where things are going and I too am very much a very strong advocate for and very much are on the, I'm on the side of humanity and I'm very much not on the side of allowing programmers to take over the jobs of artists by any stretch of the imagination. I don't want companies like Adobe or, or Stable Diffusion or any of these different companies um, damaging the integrity of our industry as artists and our employability and our ability to take care of ourselves. I have followed all the court trials. I have, I have made multiple videos about that kind of stuff, but I'm not worried. I'm not worried about that. I'm I'm, I'm standing on the side of caution, but I'm also, I'm also witnessing many reasons, many more reasons to be very optimistic moving forward. And I see, I'm regarding to date, and I'm going to stand behind my words when I say that artificial intelligence is not a threat to artists. And I'm going to stand behind that. Um, as long as we make sure that artificial intelligence knows where its place is as a tool, as a, as an enhancement, as a, as a means to expand our creative voices rather than a tool to say, you know what, we don't really need you anymore. I can just hit a couple of buttons and take care of that myself. But thank you for all of your years of service. Now take a hike. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not behind that by any stretch. This is my livelihood, of course, that's going to be, that would be damaged by that as well. I want to plant that seed of thought. I want to plant that seed of optimism that I very firmly stand behind in your head before I share the follow-up. And the follow-up is where I, uh, is a, not necessarily a negative, but it can be a negative if you let it consume you. Something that I've seen that artists didn't have back at the beginning of my career, going back 20 to 30 years ago, versus something I see a lot in artists nowadays that I want to help to relieve today. And I'm fairly confident that this is something that you've experienced in your life particularly if you're the younger you get the more sensitive and susceptible you are to this and um, although everybody's susceptible to this but i want to 
I want to shed a light on this because I can see how what we expose ourselves to artistically, socially, what we expose ourselves to online has had an impact on one important facet of our artistry, and that is our confidence. I have seen, despite all of the above that I just said, the incredible creativity, the incredible talent, the incredible cleverness, the incredible skill, the incredible hard work. I'm some of the most hardest working artists out there. Artists know how to grind, know how to push themselves. They are incredibly self-motivated. I see, at the same time that I see that incline of skill, I see an incline in a lack of confidence. I see artists that really doubt themselves more now than ever. Does that mean that artists back when I was in my artistic career lacked confidence? Or that they, they didn't lack confidence? No, I loved it. many times I lacked confidence. There's many times I had imposter syndrome. There's many times that I felt like I wasn't good enough. I've spoken about that many times on my channel, but it's not the same. I find that artists nowadays, when you when I look at an artist who I feel is absolutely phenomenal, like really, like professionally skilled and really good to go and, and very impressive, not only in their own work, but just in the industry in general, because I've got my, I've got my eye to the entire industry all the time. This is my job. It's my, it's what I do for a living. And I look at their stuff and I say, you're, you're absolutely incredible. I'm amazed how many times an artist will look at me and go, really? Do you really think so? And they're not saying that out of modesty. They're saying that because they've never heard that before. They never thought in a million years a professional would look at their artwork and say, yeah, you're incredible. And that really surprises me because what that's telling me is, well, it's telling me multiple things. The first thing it's telling me is, um, you are very clearly overexposed to other artists. You're overexposed to the abundance of talented skill worldwide. You are inundated with um, talent. You just you just see talent everywhere you go. Now, the irony of it is there's, there was just as much talent when I was a kid. There were just as many artists of so many different varieties that anime and manga existed long before <laughs> I discovered it. I just wasn't aware of it because we didn't have that access. The only time I would ever get access to something like a manga or different different artists from Europe or from Africa or from the Philippines or anytime I'd want to expose myself to these different talents, I would have to actively go out and seek it. I would have to go to comic book stores. I would have to go to art stores. I'd have to travel to specialty stores, sometimes not even in my city. Seeking artwork and seeking exposure to different types of art would require me to get a a, 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 a multipass at the Fine Arts Museum in Montreal, or I'd have to go and visit a, a, an art museum in Toronto or New York or uh, somewhere in somewhere in Europe. Although I've never been to Europe, I've never been overseas. I know I'm very uncultured. <laughs> I'm, I'm a homebody, but um, I, I mean to change that soon. But I, I really had to go and actively seek art. I had to go and look for it. I'd have to be lucky enough to find a book in a bookstore that they just happened to sell that they didn't sell somewhere else. I've even told, I remember looking for art, the art of animation by Preston Blair, a book I looked for everywhere because I heard that it was one of the best animation books you could get. And I went to Toronto and I went to the States. I was looking all over the place for it. Went to all the bookstores all over the place. Couldn't find it until I realized they sold it at the art store 15 minutes away from where I, where I lived in a little a little dinky little art store. And it was a book I had when I was a kid. I didn't even realize it was a book I already that already existed. This was an activity. It was an adventure seeking art. Nowadays, it's we just have it all sitting whoop, right there. Art station and Google and and Pinterest and anywhere you want to go, you've got everything you want at arm's length. You want to learn, you want to become a professional weeb, know everything there is about manga and anime. All the resources are right there. You go on a website, you find out what all the different movies are. You can find the timeline. You can go on YouTube and do watch an entire documentary on, on Miyazaki or, or Kojima or whatever you want. You can go and you can track these people down. 
And you can do all that research and within weeks or months you can become practically a professional on the subject. This was non-existent when I was a kid. And as the expression goes, ignorance is bliss, right? <laughs> I might not have been as, as educated, I might not have had as much access to that information. But that also allowed me to feel a little bit safer in my own little creative bubble. To be able to isolate myself a little bit. And as an artist, as much as we do need to expose ourselves to different things out there and be aware of what's out there, artistically, it's equally important for us to also isolate ourselves when we're in our creative headspace. We do not want to overexpose ourselves to too many different varying artists because the process, the thought process, the creative process that goes behind, um, why am I playing with my mouse? That goes behind um, getting into that flow into that groove requires you to have to just allow yourself to be to have confidence what you're already doing and to quiet the outside voice outside voices and just get lost in your own little creative bubble and this is one of the reasons why i've spoken in the past but when i get into my art zone i have a curated pinterest page that's only the kind of art that really relates to the kind of stuff that i do my little closed gated community of art inspiration and I'll, I'll put Vadi Vidya on, or I'll, maybe I'll watch an Anthony Jones video or another YouTuber's video, who an artist who particularly produces art in a way that, I'm, that I relate to. There's a reason why I listen to Anthony Jones, or I listen to Hardy Fowler when I'm painting, or I listen to Scott Flanders when I'm painting, or I watch you know something about Gisweb, not Gisweb Bekszynski, but um, I love Gisweb's work, but um, just a relatable artist is because if I watch, Ross Draws, if I watch Ethan Becker, if I watch uh, um, Tyler Edlin, my dear friend Tyler Edlin, if I watch them while I'm painting, that is the emotional equivalent of somebody walking up behind me and pushing me on the ground, knocking me off balance. Because as an artist, I'm very visual, I'm very impulsive, I'm very easily inspired, I'm very easily influenced, I'm very sensitive, and if I'm watching Tyler's work while I'm painting, his work is so different, and his mindset is so different, and his, and his, his process is so different for me, it derails me, it knocks, it knocks me off balance. And I've learned from experience over the years that being knocked off balance, it can take days or weeks, sometimes even months, to get back on my feet again and get myself back into my bubble, back into my groove, find my flow, find my integrity artistically and keep going. So I avoid watching Tyler. I avoid watching Ross. I avoid watching Ethan when I'm painting because I know that that influence can really, really derail me. It knocks the wind out of my lungs and I have to find my way back again. This is another reason why years ago I posted a video saying why I'm afraid of ArtStation. Why I'm afraid of ArtStation. Um, it's for that exact reason. It derails me. I'm exposing myself to just way too much great talent that's way different than mine that I can't relate to. I don't know how they produce. I don't know the tools they use. I don't know the process. I don't know where they're from. I don't understand the cultural influences that made what they did. And it's so good and it's so seductive. It just derails me. Social media does this to us on a regular basis. Social media is constantly telling us what's out there. It's, it's, big, it's like a big show-off board, right? Oh, look what this person can do. Look what I can do. And people are always putting their best foot forward. And you're, the people who are producing the best stuff are always getting the most attention. That's life, man. Hot shots are always, always have the spotlight shine on them. That's reality. But that's why I avoid them. I avoid that. I don't... I'll be completely honest with you, man. There's a reason why I don't post on Instagram a whole lot. There's a reason why I don't... Why I don't... I don't push my content everywhere. Every now and then I might update my art station. I'll throw a couple of other pieces up there. Every now and then I might throw some stuff on, on Instagram. But by going on that platform, it's a hook 
So I go on the platform and sure shit, there's going to be some really gorgeous artwork there. Or, of course, some, some cute girl in yoga pants that wants to make me look at it, right? Some clickbaity stuff. And um, I don't want that. I don't want to be, I don't want to be pulled in. I don't want to be seduced into scrolling. I don't want to be, I don't want to overexpose myself to stuff. I want to be exposed to skill. I want to be exposed to masterful art. I want to be exposed to to skill. I want to be able to compare myself to other artists, but not other artists that speak an artistic language that I don't understand and that won't contribute to the growth I want to produce in my own artwork. So I can watch Anthony Jones do a painting. I can hear him explain a principle. I can listen, to, I can watch Hardy Fowler do a video and explain a certain principle and watch the way he renders something out. But because I think and create very similarly to them, because I have a very similar mindset, that doesn't derail me. That fuels me. That encourages me. That inspires me. That helps me compare what I do to what they do and say, ah, I see how they did this. Now I understand what I'm doing better. I'm looking at what I do where they might be doing part, their, parts of their artwork might be at a higher standard, a higher skill level than what I can do. And that's encouraging to me because that's, to me, a leveling up of self. It's not a losing sense of self. And there's a very big difference between these two things. And this is something that we have to be aware of. And it, it, it makes perfect sense to me, as a teacher, why so many of these artists that I work with, that I am inspired by, that I love, that I, that I am at, I'm, I'm completely at awe at what they can produce. When I turn to them and I say, your artwork is very professional, very inspiring, and very impressive, and you're good to go, and they go, you really think so? Or if, if I'm looking at somebody who's like one of the top professionals out there and they're saying, I'm not sure if I'm right, I just need to get a little bit better before I'm ready to apply. I'm saying they're going, no, you can keep you can keep waiting for that for that ship to arrive for the next 50 years. It's not gonna go. You you, you gotta apply today. Go, get it. Right now you're good to go, your portfolio's good to go, go, do it. <laughs> oh, are you sure? Well, I'm not ready for this. You should have been ready 10 years ago. Go. Get lost. Get out of here. As Levy would say from uh, Gotham Chess, get out of here, right? <laughs> um, yeah. What, I'm, what I want, the, the piece of advice I want to give you moving forward is you have to, as an artist, as a professional, you have to be self-aware. You have to know when you're ready. Yes, speaking to a professional sometimes is necessary to be able to know whether you are ready because you could have a false sense of self and think that you're good enough, but there's certain weaknesses in your portfolio that might need to be polished up before you're really ready to, to launch yourself out there. But maybe not. Maybe you're ready today. But if you overexpose yourself to all these different incredible talents, this is kryptonite to your flow. It's kryptonite to your discovery of self. If it's kryptonite to your confidence. And I see this happen to artists all the time. And I feel that my response, my, my job as, as a teacher, one of my growing responsibilities as a teacher is not just to teach art and not just to offer students tools on how to improve themselves technically with their fundamentals and artistic skills. It's to be the voice to let them know when they're ready. It's to be that voice to let them know how good they are. I make a very strong point of really highlighting quality art when I see it in artists and let them know it. Even though in the back of my head, I'm thinking to myself, of course, they must know that they're that good, obviously. It's like that really gorgeous person in your school that everybody's in love with. And that everybody, oh, who, don't bother giving this person a compliment. They're gorgeous. They probably get compliments every day. No, they probably never get compliments because they always assume somebody else's compliment. They've already been complimented by somebody else. These people don't get compliments. They need you. You need to walk up to the gorgeous people every now and then and let them know how gorgeous they are because they're not hearing it either. They're not hearing it. They're just like you. They're on Instagram looking at all these other pictures of hot girls or hot guys in yoga pants and they feel like their body isn't up to snuff. They feel like their skill isn't up to snuff. I want you to know that 
that if you're feeling this lack of confidence in your abilities and that's that has a domino effect on your sense of self on your sense of skill on your hope for the future artistically on how much you feel you'll be able to how much you'll be able to be a valuable contributor to the world of art moving forward i've seen through the history of art and through where we are today that you are in a magnificently good place and the only reason why you might feel like you are a a needle in a haystack of artists out there is not because there are so many more artists today than have existed in the past it has nothing to do with that it's just because you're just overly aware of how many other artists out there there are just as many artists out there today as there were 30 years ago when i started my career i just didn't see them i didn't have google i couldn't i i couldn't look at them in front of me and say wow look at how many there are i was much more i was in a much safer little gated local community of artists the only people i could compare myself to were my peers in school were the people i worked with it was a much clo much more closed community of artists out there you have you have a lens into the entire world right now which is a blessing because it helps you to increase up your standard it exposes you to talent but it's a curse because it makes you feel insignificant and i can tell you with absolute confidence as a teacher as a professional you have nothing to you have nothing to worry about this industry isn't going anywhere. There's no big mad monster that's coming that's going to come in and eat you all up and, and spit you out. You are in an excellent place. You are amongst a community of fellow artists that feel exactly the same way you do. They all have imposter syndrome too. They all feel like shit about themselves. But you are by far some of the most talented, gifted, clever, creative artists that have ever existed on the planet period and you have everything to look forward to moving forward with that said happy holidays you beautiful people to my family of artists out there i love you all with all my heart and happy painting <laughs>